Hey all. Hello. Hello. Kaylee, you look so relaxed outside there. You know, I think I, I'm going to start taking class outside. I think it's a good idea. Oh my God, Morgan, that is perfect. It is. Oh, yeah, we should all just hang out outside yeah. if we can. That's good, Morgan. I like the hammock. That's good. <laughs> this is much more fun than my CS5 class. <laughs> Am I frozen? Am I frozen? Are you guys seeing me skip? Because I'm seeing you skip occasionally. I'm wondering if it's my internet. Uh-oh. Um. Or bandwidth is low or something like a zoom message i'm i'm not sure whether that's showing up for everyone but that's what i saw yeah okay all right i think i'm back i changed i changed wi-fi routers hopefully this is better is this better so far so good so far so good okay all right yeah it's still slow this happened to us the other day i wonder if it's the afternoon this morning i didn't have any trouble i wonder if there's more people on in the afternoon that could be. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, Catherine is dealing with a broken pipe in her house. She was waiting for plumbers. So I think it's just going to be us. Are we all, let's see if we're all here. We got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We've got 11 of us. That's pretty good. I think all but one is here. So let's get started. Let's get started. Let's see. Hopefully my technology will work better this time than last time as well. Somebody else just showed up. All right. So let me share my iPad screen. And give me a minute to arrange the windows on my computer. That's good. And that's good. All right, cool. Good. All right. A um, couple of quick things. Hopefully everybody's sort of done or almost done with the coding assignment. I think that's still due tonight. Um, we're at 5 o'clock or something. I can't remember what time Catherine put the deadline on. If you're having trouble, we know everyone's dealing with challenges from home. Just let us know if you're having real trouble and I'm sure we can give you an extension. Um, the written part of the homework, I don't think Catherine's changed the due date yet, but we will. It will be due at least the class day, uh, probably next Thursday at the earliest. Next Tuesday is when we're gonna finish talking about discrete curvature. And so um, it'll be due at least next Thursday, maybe even the following Tuesday or something for the written part of the homework. I've been post I posted, hopefully you all got my email about this. I posted the video from last week's lecture on the resources, under the resources section on Piazza. And the other thing I did is um, Keenan Crane's also teaching this class this semester at the same time at Carnegie Mellon. And he's in the same boat as us. They're all online, so he's, roughly at the same point in his class, and he's recording his lectures. So you can see how the author of these slides would have lectured about all these things and compare and contrast. Um, doesn't look like he's caught the mix-ups in, in the phi and theta confusion. He just kind of went ahead with that. I don't think he's changed his slides at all. So the other thing is everything I did last time and everything I did today, and I'm gonna do today, he's done in one lecture. Um, so I've broken it up, and I don't know how he did it in one lecture, because I had trouble getting through that stuff last time. Um, I know we had some technology problems last time. It took me a while to get going. Catherine and I talked to you a while about the new class format and everything. And then I ended up trying to squeeze the full day lecture into the time we had. And we ended up only having like, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes or something. And so uh, the timing was a little dicey. Um, and I'm sorry about that if I lost people. 
but I'm happy, always happy to answer questions about that. Um, today's lecture is really the second part of Keenan's first lecture. <laughs> if you look at his slides from his original course webpage, I just broke them up. So um, I, today's should be much, much shorter. So we should have lots of time at the end of today's lecture to go back to last time and do things slower if you all have questions, um, especially just the last like six slides on the last lecture I know were really harried. So let's, um, let's just go through things today. And today gives us a nice overview of um, what's called Steiner's formula. And it's just a completely different way of discretizing all of these things that we've been talking about, mean curvature, Gaussian curvature, total mean curvature. And um, it gives us a nice overall uniform picture of everything. And then when we lay, relate that back to the stuff we did last time, it, it really ties everything together in a beautiful way. Morgan, I think your mic's on and causing some feedback. My computer decided to crash and I moved it to my phone, which I haven't done oh, okay. before, but I'm doing it. So you're on your phone now. That's why you're in that sort of vertical format. Yeah, I think I, my computer's up again, though. Okay, cool. All right. Um, today's all going to be all about explaining the right side of this picture. Hopefully now my pen will work this time. If you noticed last time, oh yeah. Yeah, there we go. Last time I pointed out that this is kind of like a self-contained box, and this is a self-contained box. And these boxes have no real tie between them. And that's what we're doing today. There, there is a nice link between them, and that's what's going on here in the Steiner formula on the right-hand side. Is that ties that top box to the bottom box, and then there's a tie between this box and this box over here with this, and then we can tie that to the last bit, which is the total Gaussian curvature, with this arrow. So it's these arrows over here that are really gonna bring us together and relate all of these quantities. Every one of these quantities kind of fits into a bigger picture, and this whole picture is really connected to itself. And it, it's actually, I think what we're gonna do today is significantly easier than what we did last time. We're not gonna use any forms, no differential forms, no wedge products, no integrals. It's gonna be just basic, basic, simple algebraic calculations. And somehow all these formulas just pop out of these simple calculations. So if you follow nothing we did last time, a lot of those formulas you're gonna to see today. And, and what I think is an easier way. And the idea is fairly simple. If we just start with our original polyhedral surface, like let's just start, start with a, some sort of cube or something with flat sides. If we try to compute the curvature of that thing, we get stuff that isn't, clearly isn't what we want because on the faces, all the curvatures, the mean curvature, the Gaussian curvature, et cetera, on all these faces, you get zero because they're flat. And then on all the edges and on all the vertices, you get infinite because the derivatives are infinite there. We have these places with where, or you could say they're not well-defined. Um, so the idea is kind of melt the surface a little bit, round all the corners, round all the edges. Now you have some real curvature at all the edges and all the corners. You still have no curvature on the faces, but that's okay. So compute the curvature of the rounded thing, and then take the limit as the rounding goes to zero. And that's the idea. Just let it melt a little bit, round everything off, and then kind of undo that process with a limit. So the way technically we're gonna do this is called the Minkowski sum. I, I see the word Minkowski and I think of special relativity and I immediately get scared. So it's nothing like that. <laughs> this is actually a really easy concept. Um, if you have two sets, um, these are sets in Rn, but it's better to think of them as sets of vectors. You have two sets of vectors. Um, then you can just take all of the sums of all the vectors. So you can think, maybe you can think of A as a set of vectors and B as a, a set, sorry, A is a set of points and B is a set of vectors. And think about what happens if you add the vectors to the points. So imagine I have this point right here, A, and I'm gonna add every point in this circle to this single point, and I just get a circle there which was already part of A, and I'll do that the same over here, and 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 the same over here. Where it gets different is on the edges. If I add this circle to points on the edges, and at the corners, 
what you're seeing is when I put a circle at every point of A, then it creates this rounding. And that's exactly what we're seeing over here. All right, so the green thing is supposed to be take the blue circle, put it at every point in the red set, and the union of all of those blue circles is now the green thing. Or anybody who's had analysis, some of you have had analysis. This is also called the epsilon neighborhood. If, if B is a circle of radius epsilon, then this is called the epsilon neighborhood of A. Okay, you're just adding points at radius epsilon to all the points of A. So if we do that to a tetrahedron, here it is kind of broken up. This is the Minkowski sum of the original tetrahedron. Okay, so you can think of that as pieces. There's part of, the, part of this is where the original faces were, right? That's this stuff. And then part of this is coming from the edges, these pieces of this cylinder, that's this stuff. And part of it is also we get these spherical caps up here coming from the vertices, right? So part of that um, epsilon neighborhood, that Minkowski sum is coming from the vertices, part from the edges, part from the faces, right? And that surface, that uh, Minkowski sum surface, this thing right here, is called the mollification. So there's another vocabulary word for you. If you talk about a mollified surface, that's just a surface that's been rounded a little bit at the corners and the edges. Right? And the amount uh, you have mollified it is determined by this number epsilon. Any questions on that? I think it's a fairly straightforward question. I think this picture is totally self-explanatory. And I think it's all downhill from here. Once you understand what we're doing, how we're rounding the surface by adding a little epsilon neighborhood to everything, a little ball of radius epsilon to everything, then I think all the calculations should be pretty easy at this point. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs middle. Good, okay, cool. All right, the Steiner theorem, um, I honestly have no idea how to prove this theorem in general. <laughs> I would like to know how to prove this theorem. We're gonna prove this theorem for the specific case of a polyhedral surface. But this is a much more general theorem. It says is if A is any convex body, which is amazing, not just a polyhedral thing, but any kind of convex blob, and you mollify it, you increase it by radius epsilon, then the volume of the mollified thing is always a polynomial in epsilon. So there's some constant term, which is just the original volume is the constant term. And then there's an epsilon to the first term multiplied by some constant, and then an epsilon squared term multiplied by some constant, and an epsilon cubed term multiplied by some constant, all the way up to n, right? n is the um, dimension of the ambient space. So if this is a surface in R7, we're in seven-dimensional space, then you'll get a degree seven polynomial here. And if this is in three-dimensional space, all our surfaces are in three-dimensional space, we get a third degree polynomial in epsilon. So we're gonna see that. We're not, we don't, we're not gonna use this theorem, but it's good to know that this, what we're about to see is really a special case of this theorem. We're about to see that if you take a polyhedral surface, then there'll be a constant term, which is just the original volume, plus an epsilon term, an epsilon squared term, and an epsilon cubed term, and that's it. And all of the geometry of the surface is really captured in these constants. Those constants depend only on the original surface itself. So the original object determines these coefficients of this polynomial that tell you, the polynomial tells you as you increase the radius epsilon, how does the volume change? Right? It's kind of an amazing theorem if you think about it. The constants themselves, I have no idea how to pronounce this word, square mass integrals. Looks like one word. I'm gonna guess that must be German because German's the only language I know of where they take a bunch of words and stick them together and make one giant word. Anybody take German? Anybody know? It's gotta be German. A lot of this geometry stuff comes from Germany. Um, 
a lot of the words, like our word for integral and even our word for integer, we use the letter Z for integer, typically, because that's the German, the German word for integer is, starts with a Z. All right. Um, these coefficients, as I said, they capture the entire geometry of the surface. And, and what we'll see is they really depend on the curvature of the surface. So that's what we're after. We're trying to develop this Steiner polynomial for surfaces. And what we're going to see is that these, all these coefficients are determined by um, the curvatures. All right, so let's just start with Gaussian curvature, OK? I have some mollified surface. I have this surface that's been kind of rounded. It's been puffed out by radius epsilon. It's this puffed out surface. And I want to compute the Gaussian curvature of this puffed out surface, OK? So there, as I said, there's different pieces to it, right? There's the uh, pieces that come from these edges. Those are pieces of cylinders. There's the pieces that come from the faces. And then there's the pieces that come from the vertices, which are pieces of spheres, right? So we're going to break that down individually and look at the Gaussian curvature of each one of those pieces. Um, for the faces, the triangular faces, we just, the Gaussian curvature of a triangle, a flat triangle is just zero. That's easy, right? So on the faces, we get k equals zero. On the edges, we have pieces of cylinders, and the Gaussian curvature of a cylinder is also zero. Um, I don't know if that's a calculation we did before, but any kind of, if you have any sort of flat surface and you roll it up into a cylinder or make any shape out of a flat surface, that always has Gaussian curvature zero. Um, another way to think of it, you, maybe, maybe you already know this, because if you take a cylinder, think about the principal curvatures. The principal curvatures are going to be, you've got, you go around the cylinder, cylinder radius epsilon has um, one principal curvature that is epsilon. Sorry. You have a circle of radius epsilon in one direction. Okay? The curvature in that direction is going to be one over the radius. So we get one over epsilon as one of the principal curvatures. In the other direction, we're just going up and down the cylinder and we're seeing a straight line. So one of the principal curvatures is zero. The other one is one over epsilon. And the Gaussian curvature is the product of those. So we get zero times one over epsilon, which will just give us that zero. That's where that zero is coming from. Right? It's, it's really zero times one over epsilon. The mean curvature is zero plus one over epsilon, and we're going to see that on the next slide. So the mean curvature for a cylinder is going to be zero plus one over epsilon. The Gaussian curvature is zero times one over epsilon. So that's why we're getting this zero here. That's why we get k equals zero for the edges. Okay? So all of the Gaussian curvature is concentrated just right over here at the vertices. Now the vertices, we just have a little piece of the sphere. But here's the original sphere, and we just have a little piece of that little sphere, just the top portion. So the, to figure out how much Gaussian curvature we have there, we need first thing to know is how much of the sphere we have. And that's something we computed last time. The um, angle defect, omega i, that's exactly the fraction of the sphere of the area of the sphere we have. Right, so a full sphere would have um, a complete angle of four pi. So the fraction of that sphere is omega over four pi. Okay. And um, so that's what fraction of a sphere we have. The total amount of area of that sphere is four pi epsilon squared. So that's the amount of that's the surface area of a sphere of radius r is 4 pi r squared. If it's radius epsilon, it's 4 pi epsilon squared. And the Gaussian curvature of a sphere of radius epsilon, well, we've got the two principal curvatures are 1 over epsilon in one direction and 1 over epsilon in the other direction. The product of the principal curvatures is then 1 over epsilon squared. So the Gaussian curvature is 1 over epsilon squared. So if we look at the area times the Gaussian curvature, we have what fraction of a sphere we have. We have the total area here, and we have the Gaussian curvature. 
when we multiply all those things, the epsilon squareds cancel, the four pi's cancel, and we're just left with the angle defect. Okay, so the total curvature that we're going to associate with vertex i is just easy. It just ends up being the angle defect. Okay, so that's the curvature we're going to associate with the vertices. The curvature we're associating with the edges is just zero. And the curvature we're associating with the faces is just zero. So the total Gaussian curvature over the whole surface is just going to be the sum of all of the angles, all of the angle defects. Got it? Total uh, okay. Gaussian curvature is the sum of the angle defects. Question? Yeah, Jack, what's up? Uh, what is, what is like this total curvature? Like, what, what is this total curvature again? The total curvature? We're just, we're just trying to come up with, if we sum AI, KI over the whole surface, that's a lot like the integral of K dA. Right, so the AI is taking the place, that's the discrete version of dA, and um, the KI is the discrete version of K. Okay, so we're just trying to look at what's the total Gaussian curvature. And the reason is, let's just go back. The reason is we're, we're trying to understand this picture. And in this picture, um, we see right down there at the bottom, can I zoom in on this? Right down there on the bottom, Right, we're seeing right there is that's the total curvature. And if you remember, this was omega i. Right, so we're seeing that same expression come up. The total curvature is the discretization of just the discretization of the total curvature is just the sum of all the angle defects. And we're seeing that now, though, from a totally different point of view from last time. We're seeing that from the point of view of Steiner polynomials. We're using mollified surfaces to see that. Right, we're, we're just adding up these, the different pieces to get the total curvature. And that's, I, 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 let, me, let me point out one other thing here, is that this is the total curvature of the mollified surface. The total curvature of the rounded surface is this expression, right? That's the total curvature of the mollified surface, okay? Now, that doesn't depend on epsilon. So no matter what epsilon we pick, we get the total curvature of the rounded surface. But it's the same thing. The epsilon dropped out of this expression, which means no matter what epsilon I pick, including epsilon equals zero, I get the same thing. Other questions on that before we move on to mean curvature? Good, Jack, you okay? Riley, I like your comment. I saw that. You looked it up. Awesome. Yeah, I'm good. Okay, let's do the same thing for mean curvature. Okay, same thing for mean curvature. Um, again, the mean curvature of a face is just zero, just flat. Okay, the edges, this is exactly what I was saying before, is that um, remember to do the mean curvature, it's K1 plus K2 over two. It's mean stands for average. It's the average of the principal curvature. So I misspoke a minute ago. It's not just the sum. And on a cylinder, you've got one over epsilon curvature going around the circle and zero going the other way along the cylinder. So this is just zero plus one over epsilon over two, and that's where this one over two epsilon comes from, okay? So we have one over two epsilon is the curvature of the cylinder, but then there's a question of how much of each cylinder do we have? So what's the area of this piece of the cylinder, okay? And that expression is right here. That's the area of that piece of the cylinder. So you gotta think about where that comes from. So I wish I had a blank surface to draw on. So the area of a full cylinder, the area of a full cylinder is two pi times the radius, which in this case is epsilon, times the length, right? 
2 pi r h, 2 pi times the radius times the length. That's the area of a full cylinder. The fraction of a cylinder we have is exactly the dihedral angle divided by 2 pi. That's what fraction of a full cylinder we're working with when we just take this little piece here. Okay, so now the 2 pi's cancel and we're just left with this expression, the length times the dihedral angle times epsilon. Right, so this is the curvature of each cylinder. This is the amount of each cylinder we have. And so the amount of curvature we have for co corresponding to each edge is just the product of these two things. I just multiply one over epsilon times L phi epsilon, and that's what we get here. One half, sorry, one over two epsilon times L times phi times epsilon. That's what's giving us this expression right here. It's just the product of those two. I hope that's pretty easy to follow, right? Where the curvature of a cylinder is one over two epsilon. The amount of each cylinder we have is L phi epsilon. So you multiply them to get the curvature contribution from each edge. And you just end up with one half L phi. Okay? So that's for the edges. For the vertices, it's very similar to what we did before for the Gaussian curvature. Uh, the a sphere of radius epsilon has mean curvature one over epsilon. And that's pretty easy to see because again, the mean curvature is K1 plus K2 over two. But on a sphere, we, the both principal curvatures are one over epsilon. So we get one over epsilon plus one over epsilon over two. That's two times one over epsilon over two. The twos cancel and that's where we're getting this one over epsilon for the mean curvature of a sphere, okay? Mean curvature of a sphere of radius epsilon is one over epsilon. The fraction of a full sphere we have for each vertex is exactly what was on the previous slide. This is the fraction of a full sphere, and this is the area of the sphere. So the amount of the actual sphere of radius epsilon we have is omega i times epsilon squared. So the total contribution of each sphere to the total mean curvature you get by multiplying these two numbers omega i epsilon squared times one over epsilon all that happens is one of the epsilons cancel and that's how we get this expression for the contribution of each vertex to each gaussian to the gaussian curvature to the total gaussian curvature okay so I'll sum that up, because I'm seeing your faces and you're all looking pretty bored here. So I'll try to bring you back together, okay? So the faces give us zero Gaussian curvature, sorry, zero mean curvature contribution. The edges contribute the length of the edge times the dihedral edge, dihedral angle at each edge. That's what we get for the edge contribution. And the vertex contribution um, is a factor of the angle defect at that vertex. If we add all those up, we're getting this, right? We have a zero for the faces plus one half L phi for the edges plus epsilon omega i for the vertices, right? So this is the total mean curvature of the mollified surface, right? This is for the mollified surface. If I want the total mean curvature of the original surface, I just take that expression and let epsilon go to zero. You let epsilon go to zero, that second term goes away. And all we're left with is the first term, which is one half L phi. So that gives us a discrete expression for the total mean curvature of the original surface. And that is our missing arrow from last time. Our missing arrow was right here. We didn't do this arrow last time. We did all the other horizontal ar arrows on the left-hand side of this diagram, except for this one, right? This is the arrow that represents the discretization of the total mean curvature, the integral of the mean curvature of the whole surface. And the discrete version of that is exactly the expression we just got. You just add up phi i times li over the whole surface.
over every inch. There is a little bit of a discrepancy here. There's this one half. So um, I think that Keenan's been a little sloppy all the way through. Sometimes he, he's talking about twice the mean curvature and sometimes he's talking about the mean curvature itself. I think this is actually the expression for the discretization of twice the mean curvature. We're gonna see that too mysteriously appear and disappear all over the place. And unfortunately, I think it's just a little bit of sloppiness. <laughs> I think there should actually be a two there in the summation expression. Good? Okay. All right. So um, one more time, the total Gaussian curvature of the mollified surface is just the sum of the omega i's. Okay. Uh, sorry. I want to go back one more. The total Gaussian curvature of the modified surface is the sum of all the angle defects at all of the vertices. The total mean curvature of the mollified surface is this expression right here that I've slaughtered. Okay. The last piece of the puzzle is what's just the area of the surface? Super easy, it's just the area of the surface. Well, we've got the area of each triangle. That's what we've called AIJK. That's the area of each triangle. Okay. We've got the area of the piece of the cylinder from each edge. We just went through that calculation. That ends up being this. That's the area of the piece of the cylinder for each edge. And the area of the piece of the sphere for each vertex, we've now done that calculation twice. That's over here. That's just the angle defect times epsilon squared. So if I want the total area of the puffed out surface, the mollified surface, I just add up the area contribution from the faces, from the cylinders around the edges, and the spheres around the vertices, and I get this expression right here. Okay, and then there's a little note here about how this is related to the Euler characteristic. We don't have to know that for now. We're not gonna use the Euler characteristic today. Questions on this? This is just the area of that surface, right? Just faces, triangles, plus edges, plus vertices. Good? All right, let's move on then. Um, if I have an expression for the area of any object, now I really wish I had a blank page, but I don't. Um, or maybe I can get one. I'm gonna get one. Okay, if I have some expression for just some blob here, here's a blob. And now I puff that blob out by radius epsilon. So now I have a bigger blob. So originally I have this area a, uh, sorry, I wanted that to be blue. Originally I have area A, and then I'm gonna increase this by epsilon, okay? And now I have area um, A of epsilon. So the new area depends on how much I puff this thing out, right? So the question is, what's the volume I should make this a three-dimensional picture. Let me, let, me, let me just kill the whole picture. There, it's gone. Okay. Let's do this in three dimensions. Um, and actually, let's do it, let's do it for um, some specific examples that you already know. Okay. Let's look at um, a circle. If I take a circle, and I increase this by epsilon. What is the length of the boundary of this circle? Let's say this is a circle of radius r. What's the length of the boundary?
you all know the, the boundary of the, the, the circle it's just two pi r right <laughs> okay so the length of the boundary is two pi r what is the if i increase the size of that circle a tiny bit then this area contribution So I'm increasing the size of this circle by epsilon. Somebody tell me what the area of the shaded circle is, the shaded portion, that ring, that shaded ring, roughly that area is, this is just an approximation, stuff that, this is an approximation. You wanna guess what the area of the shaded stuff is? Matthew, I see a hand way up in the air. Is it a two pi r epsilon? Yeah. Imagine if you were to take that shaded stuff and unroll it, make it flat, make it, make it long, right? Then, then it would be, if I unroll this stuff, then I'd have this long thing that has length two pi r and height epsilon. And so the area is two pi r epsilon. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> All right, now the area I'm having a little bit of trouble ex explaining this in, in a way that I think will be understandable. Um, Give me a second here. You know what? I'm not even going to try. Sorry. The circumference of a circle of radius r is 2 pi r, right? And the area is pi r squared. The surface area of a sphere of radius r is 4 pi r squared. And the volume of a sphere of radius r is 4 thirds pi r cubed. You guys noticing a pattern here? If I want to go from circumference to area in two dimensions or area to volume in three dimensions, you seeing any patterns there? You just take the derivative. Uh, careful, I'm going up. Oh, you just uh, integrate? Yeah, you integrate. Okay, you integrate. Okay. So the vol if I know how to vary the volume, the area, then the integral of that gives me the volume in three dimensions. If I know how to vary length, then the integral of that in two dimensions gives me area. So that's what we're going to use here. If I, I have an expression here for the area, so if I want the volume, I just have to integrate that. Okay. Now, when you integrate a function, you always pick up a constant term. And the constant term is always the value of that function at zero. So what, what, what is the volume when epsilon is zero? That's just the original volume, right? V zero, that's the constant term we pick up when we integrate. So um, the area we just had before was the sum of a i j k plus epsilon times the sum of L i v i j plus epsilon squared times the sum of omega i. Okay, that was the area we had before. If I integrate the sum of the a i's, I'm gonna integrate this with respect to epsilon and that's why I picked up that epsilon. When I integrate epsilon, I pick up epsilon squared over two. When I pick up integrate epsilon squared, I get epsilon cubed over three. 
But when you integrate, you also pick up a constant term, which is just the value of the volume function when epsilon is zero. And that's what this is. Good. Riley's shaking his head at least. Somebody looks like they're with me. OK, so given that we had the area expression, now we get a volume expression just by integrating that. Remember, this is now, this is the Steiner polynomial. This is it. The Steiner polynomial was supposed to be an expression for the volume of the mollified surface. It was supposed to be a polynomial in epsilon. And it, it, if this is a surface in three dimensions, we had at most a cubic term. So going all the way back to the very beginning, right, that's exactly what we found here. It's the volume of the original surface plus some polynomial in epsilon up to the cubic term because we're in R3, is giving us the volume of this mollified surface the surface that's been puffed out by epsilon. And so we didn't need, actually need Steiner's theorem to tell us that we were going to get, you know, Steiner's theorem just tells us this is what you're going to get. And then we actually got it. Okay. All right. So let me just recap where we're at. Okay. First, we found the Gaussian curvature of the mollified surface. Then we found the total mean curvature of the mollified surface. Right, those calculations had nothing to do with each other. Then we put those all aside. And the last thing we did was we found the area of the mollified surface. And the integral of that gives us the volume of the mollified surface. Right? So now we're going to put everything together. We've got the Gaussian curvature of the mollified surface. Okay, we put that aside. We've got the mean curvature of the mollified surface. We put that aside. Now I've got the volume of the mollified surface. And we're going to focus on that and see what it has to do with the other stuff that we found. Okay, so um, first thing to notice is just immediate. If we start with the volume of the mollified surface, the way we got the volume was by integrating the area, which means if we differentiate the volume, we're just going to get the area back. We're just undoing what we just did, right? So if I take the volume and I differentiate it, of course I'm going to get the area because that's how I got the volume to begin with, was by integrating the area. So this step I think is easy, yes? The derivative of volume gives us area. Okay. All right. Now let's go one step further. Now we have an expression for the area in terms of epsilon. Let's differentiate that. So when you differentiate that, the constant term goes away, right? This is going to go away. The epsilon is going to go away. And the epsilon squared is going to turn into two epsilon. And we get exactly this expression, right? This turns to that, this turns to that, the area goes away. And that was exactly twice the expression we got already for the mean curvature. So now we're relating this back to what we did a couple of slides ago. It turns out the derivative of the area is exactly the expression we got for the mean curvature up to this fudgy factor of two. Okay. Now let's not stop there. Let's look at the mean curvature expression, if we divide that by two, we get the mean curvature. And let's take, imagine dividing all those terms by two, and then taking the derivative of that thing, the constant, so if we divide by two, this two goes away, this two goes away, we get a one half here. Now when we take the derivative of that, the constant term will disappear. Oops, the constant term disappears right? The epsilon goes away. And what we end up with is this thing. We end up with just the sum of the, of the um, angle defects. And the sum of the angle defects is exactly what we got for the Gaussian curvature. Okay, so let's put it all together now. This is the formula we got for the volume of the mollified surface. If I differentiate that with respect to epsilon, I get the area of the mollified surface. If I differentiate the area with respect to epsilon, I get the mean curvature of the mollified surface. If I differentiate the mean curvature of the mollified surface, 
I get the Gaussian curvature of the modified surface. But if I differentiate the Gaussian curvature for the modified surface, well, the Gaussian curvature doesn't depend on epsilon anymore. So if I have something that doesn't depend on epsilon and I differentiate that, I get zero. And that explains the whole right-hand side of this picture. The whole right-hand side of this picture is tying all of these things together by differentiating. So P is the Steiner polynomial. And if we differentiate that, we get the total area. And this was our discretization for the total area. And if we differentiate that, we get the total mean curvature. And this is our discretization for the total mean curvature. And if we differentiate that, we get the sum of the angle defects. And that was exactly our discretization for the total Gaussian curvature. So it's really tying this piece of the picture to that piece, to that piece, to that piece. And if we differentiate one more time down at the bottom, we always get zero. So it's, it's kind of amazing how all of these curvatures fit together in this one picture here. How all, they're all related to each other, the mean curvature, the Gaussian curvature, the area, they're all, they're all related to each other. Each one is the derivative of another one. Riley, you have your hand up, what's up? Yeah, it, sorry, is this picture, I just want to clarify, specifically for R3, or is this generalized to other, uh, other? That is an amazing, fantastic question. Um, yeah, I think in, when you move up a dimension, there's other curvatures to consider, right? You've got, um, you know, for example, that you can still define the mean curvature. Well, again, there's lots of dimensions now. So let's say I'm in R4. So in R4, we can talk about um, two-dimensional surfaces in R4 but there's also three-dimensional surfaces in R4. So um, a three-dimensional surface in R4 will have three principal curvatures. You could still talk about the mean curvature by adding them up and dividing by three. You could still talk about the Gaussian curvature by taking their product. But then there's other combinations you could take as well. Um, there's still a Steiner polynomial, and you can still look at the derivatives of the Steiner polynomial, and it will still give you some combination of all these different notions of curvature that you get. So you can certainly say something analogous in four dimensions. That's just more complicated because there's more curvatures to relate to each other. I feel like I could imagine a picture like this for the fourth dimension where there's like another layer between the third derivative and zero. That's exactly you know right. What I mean? yep. Yeah, because okay. in four dimensions, you're going to get a fourth degree Steiner polynomial, which means you'll have four derivatives. That's exactly right. So the picture just gets a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, as you would guess, there's just one slide on this. I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. I'm just going to point out that um, I think the point of this slide is that you can do this. You don't have to do everything we just did today for just polyhedral surfaces. You could do it for smooth surfaces as well. So the way you mollify a smooth surface is just by puffing out in the normal direction. So that's exactly what we're seeing right over here. We take the original parameterization, that's f, and we add to it t times the normal vector. You really should have used epsilon times the normal vector to relate this to what we were doing. If we want to puff this out, by radius epsilon, we add epsilon times the normal vector. I don't know why he switched to t's here, um, but we'll just go with it. So he's puffing things out by t, so he adds t times the normal vector. And then the question is, how is the area changing when you do that? What's the derivative of the area? Um, the area, uh, and then this relates to everything we did before. The area, remember, was um, df wedge df. Um, I think that's twice the area. I think you have to divide by two. Um, whoa, stop, what just happened? No. No. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. No. Oh, 
better. Sorry, I got lost. Okay. Um, the derivative of the area expression is going to involve the normal vector. Okay, so this is this is stuff we'd seen last time. I don't want to go through it again because I think this is where I lost everybody last time. I can already see Max asleep over there in the corner. Um, this is the danger of keeping your video on. <laughs> He's still listening to me at least. Um, but if you go through the calculations, the derivative of the area is going to give you these expressions, and then each derivative after that gives you more expressions. And then what you end up with when you take all the derivatives, you can write everything in terms of df wedge df. And that gives you the Steiner polynomial in the smooth category instead of the uh, polyhedral category. And again, the coefficients you can write down, they're just one and two th and t squared k. And so if you think about differentiating this thing now with respect to t, the one goes away after you take the first derivative and you just get some expression with the mean curvature. And then um, that goes away when you take another derivative and then you get some expression with the Gaussian curvature. So you get some very analogous things going on. I don't want to spend a lot of time explaining this, um, but, it, but again, I mean, we're doing something wrong if the smooth stuff doesn't exactly mirror the discrete stuff. The whole point of discretizing all of these geometric quantities is so that everything algebraically behaves the same. So if you see some phenomena happening in the smooth category, like the Steiner polynomial, the coefficients depending on the curvatures, then in the discrete category, the way we discretize stuff, we better see the same sort of, sort of thing happen. Questions on this? There's no questions on this. I want to go back to what we did last time and just try to explain a little better the last couple of slides from last time, because I know I went through them super fast. Do you all agree that this was easier? I think this was easier than what we did last time. I mean, in, in every instance, we're just like taking a piece of a cylinder and a piece of a sphere and adding and just doing basic arithmetic, basic geometry. Okay, cool. All right. Um, all right, last time, let's go back to last time. Because last time I know this stuff got really harried. Um, I think this is this is about the point where it really went off the rails last time. I know I was really rushing through this at this point last time, and we've got uh, we've got about twenty minutes. We got more time than we did last time. I think at this point I had about five minutes last time. Uh, so let's see if we can go through this a little bit slower so people understand this. Because this stuff is kind of amazing to me, and it's very understandable if you take it slow. But you got to take it slow, okay? So we were back trying to explain this picture, and the next thing we were about to do was um, the discrete mean curvature. I think the next thing we were about to do is this expression this expression right here. That's what we're about to do, is that cotan formula. And that cotan formula is going to keep coming up over and over and over and over and over again. You've already seen it a lot. Um, and this one is probably the thing of everything in this whole chart, this is the most important one for sure. And what we're, what we're going to see, especially next time, next time we're going to explain, by the way, on Tuesday, Tuesday we're going to explain this arrow, this arrow, this arrow, this arrow, this arrow, and this arrow. That's going to be the point of the day Tuesday. Just a whole different approach to thinking about how all these quantities are related to each other. Then next Thursday, we're going to start delving into the Laplacian. And the Laplacian, again, this formula right here is just going to come up a lot. And the Laplacian is going to be like our main tool for all the geometric algorithms we're going to see after that. Okay? So it's really important you understand this one arrow in this whole diagram. And I was really rushing through that last time. So, that, so, so let's, let's delve into it. We're trying to get an expression for the integral of the mean curvature times the normal vector. Okay, So hn is what we're integrating. So now going back to this slide here, here's 
Hn. And if we want to integrate over that surface, we're going to do the integral of Hn dA. Okay. And then we had all this stuff last time with wedge products and differential forms. I'm not going to review this so much because I did spend some time on this last time. And I think this calculation is when you take it slow, just look at it one equality at a time. This one I think is pretty understandable as long as you take it slow. If you just glance at this slide, it's going to completely overwhelm you. But just take it one equality at a time. And what you'll see is that Hn is just df wedge dA. Okay, Hn dA is df wedge dA. That's all you got to know for the calculation we're about to do. Hn is df wedge dA. Hn dA, sorry, that whole thing. Hn dA is df wedge dA. Okay. The wedge product in R3, the wedge, sorry, the wedge product for vector valued forms is different than the wedge product for real valued forms. And one of the main differences is that it is commutative. When you have a vector valued wedge product, you can switch the order. If it was a real valued function, you picked up a negative sign, you would switch the order. So that's just the next equality. Since these are vector valued forms, we can switch the order. Okay. And the next equality is just rewriting that as a derivative. This is the same thing. When we had a zero form wedged with a n form, so that's a zero form. This was way back at the beginning of the class. If I differentiate that, I just get df wedge omega. Okay, so the zero form, when you, when you differentiate, technically you have to use the product rule. Uh, sorry, there should have been a d omega in here, damn it. Let me stick a d in there. You have to use the product rule. You get df wedge d omega plus f wedge d d omega, but the d d omega goes away, right? So all you're left with is just this expression. And that's all that's happening here in this next arrow is that we're rewriting dn wedge df as the derivative of n wedge df. Okay? And the reason we're doing that is because now we're set up for the generalized Stokes theorem. When I integrate d of something, I can rewrite that as the integral of just that something over the boundary. Right? So the integral of d of omega over c, that's the integral of omega over the boundary of c. That's just the generalized Stokes theorem. That's all we're doing to go to the next equal sign, to go here. All right. Um, the next equality, whoa, heck. the next equality going from here to here is we're just adding things up. So the boundary of C, so okay, again, what is C? C is supposed to be this dual cell right here. So the boundary of C are these individual edges. Okay, so when I integrate over the boundary of C, I can do that by summing up the integral over each edge. Hey, Catherine's with us. Catherine, you just joined us? Hi. I'm having an exciting day here. Yeah, how's your plumbing? I think I can actually fix it myself, but I'm going to have to brave going to Home Depot after this. Yeah, so look at that. Yeah. It, it turns out like maybe um, somebody soldered my pipes for the very first time soldering bad. 20 years ago. Yeah, it's bad. Flux everywhere. Yeah. Bad. Um, Are you still going to have office hours after this? Uh. How much are people relying on my office hours being right after this? Keep in mind, you get unlimited extensions due to my house being <laughs> leaky. I personally have a lot of questions, but I guess okay. I can postpone them if... No, that's fine. Okay. I can, yeah, let's talk right at 2.30 then. Okay. Okay, cool. Sorry. Catherine, do you, do you solder plumbing? Do you know how to solder? 
I do know how to solder, although I think I'm going to actually just wuss out and use a shark bite on yeah. this one. That's um, exactly what I was going to suggest. Yeah, the shark bites are easier. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so much easier. The pipe's wet inside and... Yeah. 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 There you go. Okay. Sorry, house stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, where are we? Oh, so Catherine, just to catch you up, we've already been through all the stuff about Steiner polynomials. Yay! So that was pretty quick, I think, and, and much easier than everything we did last time. And so I decided to go back to like the last six slides from last time that I rushed through in five minutes last time since we have some- Oh, this time. is great. Okay, cool. Try to explain them a little better. So we were working through this slide on the integral of um, Hn, mm -hmm. and I'm just trying to go through slowly and explain every equality that you see in this expression at the top there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we were right here, just trying to go from the integral over the boundary of the dual cell to the sum. That's all we're doing there is just saying, hey, if I want to integrate over the each edge, all these red edges in the picture on the right there, I can just do each integral individually and add them up. So now, it's, now I have this summation here because I'm just integrating over each one individually. And the thing to keep in mind is we're not EIJ. This is EIJ right here, okay? This is EIJ star. So that's why you see those EIJ stars. We're integrating over the boundary of the dual cell, which means each piece of the boundary of this dual cell is a dual one cell, okay? EIJ star is this thing right here. That's EIJ star as opposed to that, which is EIJ. Okay. So that's what's going on here. Um, now, um, let's move on. The next integral is where I think it gets a little bit harder to understand. You just got to remember uh, two things. So there's two things going on with this next equality. So first of all, if I integrate over this blue, we're integrating over again, um, I'll change colors. We're integrating over this. Just think about what happens when you integrate over that one little dual edge. We can break that up into two different integrals. It's the integral over, I need more colors. Um, it's the integral over this piece of it, plus the integral over, um, back to red, this piece of it over here, okay? So there's the yellow piece and the red piece makes up the full thing, right? So this term is going to be the integral over, oh, I should color code that. So this term is the integral over the yellow thing. And um, this term over here is going to be the integral over the red bit. Okay. All right. So now where do those terms come from? So let's th just remind you what n wedge df is. That's just n of, um, n, so okay, <laughs> you integrate over an edge by plugging in tangent vectors to that edge into the form, okay? So the way we plug in tangent vectors into the form n wedge df is we do n of the tangent vector cross df of that minus df cross n, right? It's going to be n cross df minus df cross n, okay? n of that tangent vector is just going to be, um, it's just constant all along that edge. So that's where we're getting this n of a expression from, right? You just have this constant normal vector along that edge. That normal vector is pointing out at you right over here. There's n of a. It's pointing directly out of the screen right at you, okay? And if I integrate df of the tangent vector along that edge, that's just the total of df of a tangent vector along an edge is just the total length of that edge, okay? So that's where this m minus express a expression coming from. It's just the total length of that little yellow thing is m minus a, okay? And then similar to the other side, the total length of the other piece of it, the red piece is b minus m, 
and we have n of b, which is this normal vector coming straight out at you right at the center of the other face at b. Okay. I think this, this particular equality is the hardest to understand. Okay. Next, let's think about each piece of it. So we have n, this whole thing right here, just n of a cross m minus a. So let's go to the next slide. So n of a cross m minus a. We're looking at this piece right here, n of a cross m minus a. That's just um, m minus a is this vector up here. I'll do it in orange again. m minus a is right there. And it's coming straight out at you, right at the middle. Okay, so if I have a vector pointing directly to the right and a vector pointing straight toward me, and I cross those, that has the effect of turning the one pointing to the right, turning it clockwise by 90 degrees. Okay, it doesn't change its length, it just turns it by 90 degrees. So that new thing is going to get moved 90 degrees and it's going to be there. It's not going to be as long as going all the way down to J. It's only going to be as long as M minus A is. It's just in a different direction. And so when I cross it with N, it rotates at 90 degrees. Okay. And similarly, the other part of it, if I look at B minus M, that's the other half. And when I cross that with N, it rotates that 90 degrees and now it points up this way. And so the thing I'm left with is here. Once I do those two cross products, I have this thing, which is in the same direction as EIJ. EIJ is this full thing, but it has the length of the dual thing, right? So the length of this thing is the length of EIJ star, but the direction is in the direction of EIJ. Yeah, I can't write that. Oops. So if I normalize EIJ, then I get its direction. Okay, so it's a vector. It has length EIJ star and direction EIJ over magnitude EIJ. So that's exactly what we get. It's what we end up with. It's right here. It's EIJ over the magnitude of EIJ times the length of EIJ star. Okay. So how does that relate to the formula at the bottom? Okay, so first of all, EIJ itself, the way you get a vector along EIJ is I take the location of vertex I and the location of vertex J and I subtract them. That's where this is coming from. FI minus FJ is just the vector, how you would compute the vector EIJ. You take the endpoints of EIJ and subtract them. Okay. And what's left is the ratio of the length of the dual edge to the length of the original edge. Now that's exactly how we computed the Hodge star of an edge. Remember the Hodge star was the ratio of the length of the dual to the length of the primal. And when we did that calculation, I think you had a homework assignment where you proved this yourself, or maybe that was one of the options of the problems. The ratio of the length of the dual to the length of the primal is exactly the cotan formula. So this piece of it is right there. I mean, there's a lot to digest here. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Probably still gonna require you to go back and stare at this for a while. But it's worth going through every single equality in this slide and just make sure you understand how to go from equality to equality to equality. It is understandable if you spend the time with it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Going forward one more time. So again, that's this. And now again, I'm back to only having five minutes for the last slide. 
but I think when I did it last time, I only had two minutes. So let's see if we could understand some of this at least in five minutes. <laughs> One more time too, this is the last slide. Here we're looking at the expression for um, the integral of k and dA. k and dA, when if you go flip back to that slide where we had those different wedge product calculations, that just turned into dN wedge dN. We did it the other way on that slide. We showed dN wedge dN as k and dA. Um, and there's this extra two that you pick up. Just like we did before, um, you can rewrite that as the derivative of n wedge dn. And the reason why you'd want to do that is because now you can use Stokes theorem to rewrite that as the integral over the boundary of C of n wedge dn. And this is a lot like the previous slide, because we're just doing these form manipulations. We're writing the form as the derivative of some other form so that we can now replace that with an integral over the boundary of the dual cell. Okay, and um, now you've got to remember that the wedge product is just the cross product. I think there's a two that got lost in this calculation somewhere. It should really be two times the cross product. And maybe that two at the very beginning should have been carried through, but all of these calculations on every slide, I think I've mentioned this five times now, there's always a mysterious two that appears and disappears. And some of that may be intentional and some of that may be sloppiness. So just don't worry about the twos. <laughs> um, all right, so n wedge dn. Again, we're gonna integrate that over every piece of the boundary of C. Okay, but now we're really thinking about this more in three dimensions rather than thinking about the two dimensional analog. So the boundary of C now is this thing that goes all around. Um, so C is up here. The boundary of this C is going all around this surface. Each piece of the boundary of C is just a parameterized curve now in three dimensions because we're gonna puff this out. Think of this as sitting on a sphere. That's how we're going to do this integral calculation is we're going to puff it out and do the integral calculation on a sphere. Okay, so remember when we puff this out, it turned into this picture over here. And that vertex at the very top turned into this thing at the center. And all these places where there were normal vectors, um, right here, right here, right here, those are turning to these points on the sphere. Okay. And when we go from normal vector to normal vector, we're going along an edge on the sphere. Okay, so that's a that's a curve in three dimensions. So we're doing an integral along a parameterized curve in three dimensions. And the way you do that is you compute the tangent vector to that curve. So that's what's going on going from here to here is that that gets dn of gamma prime is going to get replaced with the tangent vector. Now, why, now that's worth explaining why that is. Um, and that comes from um, just remembering that the derivative of the normal to a curve is the tangent vector of the curve. That was one of our, that goes all the way back to when we were looking at the, um, the um, I'm blanking. <laughs> Back in, in two dimensions, if I have a two dimensional curve, so I have a curve in two dimensions. I have some curve in two dimensions and I've got the tangent vector and the normal vector. The derivative of the tangent vector is gonna give me the curvature times the normal vector and the derivative of the normal vector was minus the curvature times the tangent vector, okay? So that's how this dn is turning into t. And we're using a sphere of radius one, which means the curvature is one. So on a sphere of radius one, that just just one. So that's how the dn turned into the t. Okay, it's a little, there's a little bit of uh, stuff to remember from stuff we did much earlier in the term there to understand why the dn turned into a t, okay? Then from there on in, I think it's not too bad. So n cross t, what's that? Well, let's look at this picture to understand n cross t. This is like a cross section of the sphere that we're looking at. Here's n, here's t. So n cross t is pointing straight at you. 
okay? And if you think of it in three dimensions now, the vector pointing straight at you is just the edge vector. So here's N pointing out of the surface. Here's T pointing along the surface. So N cross T is pointing along the edge in three dimensions. You gotta really think about this in three dimensions. Right, the normal vector to the face is N. Oops. The normal vector to the face is N. The tangent vector points along the face, perpendicular to the edge. So when you cross those, you get a vector that points along the edge. So that's what we're getting over here. There's a vector that points along the edge, but it's a unit vector, so we have to divide it by its length. Okay. Now we're gonna integrate that along that curve. We have to ask how much of that curve do we have? And that's exactly what the dihedral angle is giving us, is the fraction of the curve we have. So that's why the dihedral angle starts popping up. So the length of the edge, that turns into the Lij, the fraction of the curve we have is where we're getting the phi ij. And when you put that together, you get this expression right here. Eij again turns into fi, fj minus fi. Okay, that's how you compute the length of that edge, is sorry, a vector along the edge as you subtract the endpoints of the edge. So again, there's a lot of scribbling on this slide. <laughs> But I hope I'm, I'm trying to convey to you that each of these equalities, if you just take them slow and just think about what's happening, they're understandable. It just takes, you have to take some time to understand where they come from. And that's how we're getting this last expression over here is um, just by going through that last slide, okay? So at this point, let me explain just where we're at because we're out of time. At this point, hopefully we've gone through all of the horizontal arrows here, all of the horizontal and vertical arrows here, okay? Um, this diagonal arrow we did, the derivative of that last Steiner polynomial. So all that's left are the vertical arrows on this side and the vertical arrows over here. And that's what we'll do on Tuesday, are those vertical arrows. And then this picture is complete and hopefully you'll have a good understanding of, or at least some, even if you don't have like a really deep understanding of everything that we've said over the last two days, I hope that the one thing that's being conveyed to you is that this is a giant puzzle with lots of pieces and they all fit together beautifully to make one complete picture. And that's, that's, if you just walk away with that knowledge, then I think you're, you're doing pretty well. Any last minute questions before we call it? Catherine, you want to add anything? I'm just, I'm just excited to be here. I'm excited to go back and watch the first part of the lecture so I can learn about Steiner polynomials, which is not a strength of mine. So <laughs> bring all your Steiner polynomial questions to Prof. I think, I think, Catherine, I think once you go through it, I think they're, they're easier than any of the stuff we, you just tuned in for by a lot. I mean, I do like a polynomial, so I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. See you all next time. Oh, wait, I have one more question. Oh. Um, um, should, oh. uh, I, it's about the um, due date for the, the written stuff that covers the rest of this. Should we do next Thursday so everybody has a full week? Let's, let's shoot for next Thursday, and if people are having trouble, we can push it back more. OK, so next Thursday, I think, is the 15th. Is that right? Or not 15th. Uh, the, Ninth. Looks like, uh, yeah, the ninth. That's right. Okay. Great. Cool. All right. Okay. It'll be due the ninth. And I'll put this video <laughs> up, up on the resources uh, tab on, on Piazza. Cool. Prof Frieden, can we see Tinkerbell? Oh, Tinker. She's, um, <laughs> she's, I want you to know this cat is extremely soft. Tinker, say oh. hi. She's like, no, I hate being held. But this part is the softest part right here. And oh, please God. notice, whoop, Tinker has a very little tail. That's her defining feature. Oh. How long have you had Tinker? Since grad school, uh, maybe five years. Oh.
Yeah, I can tell you that my mental health as a graduate student uh, improved substantially getting a uh, cat. So I can recommend that. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. Or a dog. You guys want to see? Or a it? dog. Dogs work too. <laughs> Dave, did you have a dog in grad school? I didn't. Oh man. See, see. This is a picture in the LA Times today. That's my son and and our dog. He was in the LA Times today. <laughs> Buddy, that's a great picture. Oh my God. Yeah, there's an article in the LA Times on just photos of people dealing with the, uh, the quarantine. This is how my son deals with the quarantine as he goes in a park with our dog and sits and plays guitar. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's call it there. <laughs> All right, so my uh, my office hours will move to the link that's on um, Piazza if anybody wants to chime in now. Okay. Cool. Right, Wait, is there office hours after this? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we'll okay. Do it. okay. Okay. Bye.